What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, September 5th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy Newsbeat Stand-Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, OPEC close to delaying oil supply increase, according to Gallagher's. Talk about a 180 there. Oops. Next up, facts and speculation about the state of the Russian Indo financial ties. Ooh, spicy. Ooh. You will explain what that has to do with energy. Trust me. Next up, rare metals prices surge as China restricts exports. Interesting. Very spicy there. Next up, efficiency in capacity markets. Not capital markets. Capacity. capacity. Absolutely. Next up, the invasion of the water snatchers. Talk about some great headlines <laughs> today. Next up, he will then toss over to me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets. Crude oil down again. We're below $70. Yikes. And then we went ahead and saw a new MA deal strike through Crescent Energy buys Cheyenne Petroleum's Eagle Ford assets for $168 million. I will cover oh. all that. And a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's get start started here with OPEC. Michael, this has been fun. The bulls and the bears have been running amok. You know, who's going to win on whether or not OPEC is going to happen? I saw this one. OPEC Plus, close to delaying the oil supply. At the time we're recording this, oil has been hammered pretty brutally. The group had scheduled for October production boost or increase of 180,000 barrels, but now they're rethinking it because of the data from China. I thought that was pretty interesting. Here is a quote from Bob McNally. OPEC is facing a binary choice between delaying tapering and enduring a disorderly crude price route, said Rob, Bob McNally, president and consultant of Rappian Energy Group, a former White House official. It appears to be leaning toward the former, as he's always cautioned it would be the case. Yeah, it's I mean, we've kind of seen the 180 on this. I think it's because they saw Brent oil prices, you know, as we as we sit here, Brent oil prices have dipped. <laughs> to to pretty low. I mean, you're talking about seventy three dollar Brent, which is not nearly what they need now. I think the entire break even oil price charade that Saudi needs. Yes, they need higher oil prices, but they can also just roll back a lot of their spending, which I think it, people don't know it, about. Right, you bet. And so now, Ananias has been saying that that's the sweet spot. So it's kind of funny that they're rolling right on into the sweet spot. Yeah, but, you know, the, the 180, I think, comes as which, obviously, they would like higher prices. I think, you know, it, it's, it, it clearly shows that the market is on a little bit more of a tenuous situation than I think anybody wants to admit. So it'll be interesting yep. to see how this plays out. And we will be watching very closely this next OPEC meeting coming up. Oh, absolutely. Four years ago, do you remember the OPEC you and I were pretending we were at? That was a funny video that we we made where we were like all in there on the Zoom and we made it. Was, that was great. The, anyway, that was, that was some of the old fun days. Okay, facts and speculation about the state of the Russia Indo financial ties. This is from our buddy over there at Andrew Corbio Substack. He sent this over and it's pretty interesting and that Russia... And India weighs doable proposal on the SWIFT alternative, which is the Brinks, Brinks. But this is the first time they're actually including oil in there. And so that is why that is in here. The first revealed S. Brink handled 70% of Russia's $65 billion worth of trade of India last year, mostly Russian energy exports. This is really huge yeah it's it's really big i mean the fact that this is you know it again it comes back to it's clear sanctions don't work nope especially because people need oil and they're gonna get it by hook or by crook i'm happy for them and they're buying it you know below or outside of sanctions more power to them power to their people what a novel cause countries looking out for their own interests novel. yeah it's, wow let's go to the next one here Rare metals price surge as China restricts exports. Now, Michael, this is in the critical minerals area. You being a mines guy, antimony, 
is not what you pay after you get divorced. Antimony is actually what they use for military, automotive, and solar applications, with China producing nearly half of the global supply, Michael. That is nuts. Now, they're going to say, this is, quote, from London, it's a sign of the times. Military uses of uh, SB antimony are now the tail sign, the tail that wags the dog. Everyone needs it for armaments, so it's better to hang on to it than sell it. You don't want your other your opponents having it. No, absolutely. I mean, I, I love first off this this article is titled correctly: rare metals, not critical metals, because right there's there's a difference there, there is. and it's really critical minerals versus metals per se, but. You know, it's it's absolutely going to be pretty crazy when China and now Russia, who have both gone in to all of these countries, including now Afghanistan, and hoovered up all of the critical mineral minerals and metals that are needed to make EVs and selling it to us as a premium. And then we all turn around and say, look how green we are. And we're not. Yeah. Listen to this. Last year, China issued three batches of rare earth output quotas. The first time it issued more, that more than many quotas in a single year since it started the quota system. It's pretty nuts. Yeah. And it just means that if we don't get our regulatory issues, we our regulatory issues cost us over a trillion dollars this year. Because if we don't get our regulatory mining issues under control, we won't have an energy transition. Yep. I, I was listening to a podcast this morning with Cash Patel, who's advisor to President Trump and somebody who's a former chief of staff to the secretary of defense. And he said, it's the modern, you know, these minerals, lithium, cobalt, and they're all the modern day blood diamonds. That's exactly right. And, but you got to have it for energy because- oh. It's necessary. Don't get me wrong. But and you're not going to grow the grid twice. I mean, we're supposed to double the, the Texas grid in five years without this. It takes 20 to get a mine open. It ain't going to happen. All right. All right. What's go, next? Let's go to are you ready for this Substack author? OK, this one is the electric grandma. I, I swear that I'm not making this up. Meredith Angwin. I love Meredith Angwin. She is now the electric grandma on her sub stack. Okay. Let's go to this. Efficiency in capacity markets. On July 29th, Ethan Howard of the Utility Dive looked at the probable outcome of the next capacity auction, PJM. Capacity prices could jump 157%. Morgan Stanley, the price raise in the auction started at a low base, started at $29 per megawatt day to $270 per megawatt day. Holy smokes. It's it's <laughs> absolutely insane. I mean, you're talking about a that's a hundred and fifty-seven percent increase. It is. It's just nuts. And you know, PJM uh, is just sitting there. You've got when energy efficiency was added to the forecast and EE was removed from the capacity market. PGM should have simply followed the tariff, recognized that EE was not capacity, and recognized that EE sources do not meet the definition of EE resources filed in it. Instead, PJM recognized that EE resources are not capacity, stopped including EE resources in the capacity auction, and began to pay EE resources on uplift payment. I would, I mean, the accounting on this thing is just absolutely hilarious. Way to go, Meredith Angwin, in the way she explains this out. Yeah, no, that's awesome. All right, let's go to this last one. Invasion of the Water Snatchers. You're going to love this one. Speaking, we're having a trifecta. Today is Substack Trifecta. This is from Robert Bryce, and he brought it up on his Substack. This is about stealing land for hydrogen in Texas where they need the water and they're going to absolutely obliterate the water in order to get to hydrogen. I mean, you can't make this up. Slitcher County, known in the side road on, on County Road 339, Apex Clean Energy, a subsidiary of Areas Management Corporation, a publicly traded firm based in Los Angeles, 
would they please go back to Los Angeles and leave Texas alone? It's the project is known as Big Trail, reporting aims to lease 280,000 acres of land and install also 3,200 megawatts of alt energy capacity. This is actually out of the the hydrogen and wind energy as well too. Robert brings this up a great point. Hydrogen is so much more expensive than natural gas. You're wasting money by doing this and trying to pretend that you're bringing in a natural gas plant. It's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, I love this quote here from that image. Show me the incentives and I'll show you the outcome. Isn't it great? It's, it's really great. They'll produce less energy than a single new barrel of oil in the Permian Basin. I mean, it's 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 pretty... It's pretty, inc- it's pretty insane. That's a it, Charlie Munger quote, by the way. Do what now? That uh, show me the incentives and I'll show oh. you the outcome. That's a Charlie Munger quote. Okay, love it. But I'll tell you, when you sit back and Robert Bryce on his his substack and Meredith Angwin on her substack, she has referred a lot of people to our substack. So we love her substack and that'll be in the show notes. So shout out to both all three of our substack authors today. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, let's go ahead and jump over to the broader markets, guys. Before we do that, as always, we got to pay the bills. Thank you for checking us out on the world's greatest website, EnergyNewsBeat.com, the best place for all your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. Hit that description below for all links to the timestamps, links to the articles. Check us out on Substack, TheEnergyNewsBeat.Substack.com. And you can also check out investinoil.energynewsbeat.com uh, if you want to get involved in an awesome oil and gas direct working interest projects that we are partnering up with the team over at Pecosat. So hit us up. That's investinoil.energynewsbeat.com or hit the link in the description below. I mean, pretty yeah, markets again, a pretty tough day, Stu. We're talking, you know, over, overall markets were still down. SP 500 down about a quarter of a percent or, or about, you know, a tenth of a percentage point. NASDAQ down about a quarter of a percentage point. Two-year yields actually up a quarter of a percentage point. Ten-year yields basically flat. Dollar index down about a half a percentage point. Bitcoin up about a full percentage point. Still under 60,000, 58,000. Even right now, crude oil, not a great day. Down another 1.2 or down another 1.6 percentage points at 69.20. Brent oil down about a full percentage point, 73.16. Natural gas down two percentage points, two dollars and forty or fourteen cents. So pretty unbelievable. I mean, obviously, you know, you you've got what's going on with OPEC. You know, a lot of this now comes back to the demand issues. You know, obviously Libya coming back online, but again, as we covered yesterday, that's all smoke and mirrors from the fact that it was never going to be right. offline fully in, in in the first spot. So why would they? I mean, why why would they be again it's 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 what concerns and always bugs me a, a little bit with what a lot of what people talk about when they try to say where prices are going is they pick a narrative that they already have and they toss it out there and say well this is why it's going down it's like let's let's actually think for a little let's use our noggins let's think before we just blather out the answer i thought the interesting side of the coin api estimated crude oil inventory reserves at a 7.4 million barrel draw and oil prices haven't changed much so it goes to show you right there is a pretty pretty interesting correlation where the amount of inventories we have is being is is currently less and less correlated with where prices are going. And I saw an interesting post over there from Eric Nattel on Twitter. I don't have it up in front of me, but he basically showed a historical yearly averages of where inventories are and what the oil price was, where the at what levels those inventories was at. And we are at the lowest level of inventories we have been in five years, and the price is lower than it has been in any of those five years. Outside if you remove COVID. So obviously the amount of inventories is becoming less and less correlated to where prices are going. Exactly. In fact, Josh Young and David Blackman and I had a podcast where we talked about that and we were kind of like the old pricing matrices has changed. It's not just supply and demand anymore. 
No, it's absolutely true. Other thing that happened today, guys, Crescent Energy announced a acquisition in the Eagle Fur, Eagle Fur, a traditional quote unquote bolt on acquisition. They go ahead and swoop up Cheyenne Petroleum's Eagle Fur assets for a cool $168 million. You know, it's directly offset from Crescent's current existing Eagle Fur stuff and also builds upon the acquisition that they made with in buying Silver Bow. I remember that happened at the beginning of the year. Pretty interesting. They decided to use Moik or multiple uninvested capital as their main, you know, main financial metric to evaluate this deal. They did that at a 2.0x, which is interesting. Usually we've seen EBITDA being used, but they go ahead and use Moik or MOIC as the specific thing. You know, it's a bunch of low decline current producing stuff in Frio, Altosca, LaSalle, and McMullen counties with about 30 quote-unquote, locations available. I love how they say oil-weighted core development locations. Um, There's also about 5,300 net royalty acres available with that, so you get a little bit of both. You know, they've 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 got a really nice this this kind of keeps their their balance sheet where it's at. Cheyenne Petroleum, this is a nugget that good old our friend on Twitter, Clint Barnett, figured out. He was the one that actually figured out that Cheyenne Petroleum was the one shedding these assets. He also mm-hmm. goes to point out if we can bring this tweet up here that looks like it looks like Cheyenne is also trying to shed its Oklahoma stuff to Valdis. So we'll see if that goes ahead and takes place. Valdis has been pretty active in the space as of Recently, they went ahead recently and just swooped up uh, Citizen Petroleum. That took place at the end of 2023. So M and A, you know, nice little M and A deal for us. A little bit smaller. Again, this is a complete acquisition. Get Cheyenne Petroleum, who's based out of Oklahoma City, been around since 1973. So good for them for going ahead and getting out of there. But nice to see the M and A market still still hopping and hollering. Like it. It's uh, keep- what else, Stu? Do you have for us? Oh, not much. Just buckle up. It's going to be great. Well, all right, guys. Well, with that, we appreciate you sticking with us this entire week. Who do you got on the show tomorrow? Who are you dropping? Oh, it's going to be Savage. Mr. Savage, the the Savage Path. He is a cool cat. Had a great conversation with him. And he's a energy guy out of Houston. So it'll be rolling out in the morning. Absolutely. Love that. Love us some good David Savage. You'll hear the weekly recap. Then on Saturday, we'll take Sunday off and we'll be back in the chair come Monday morning. So guys, well, with that, have a great weekend. We appreciate you sticking with us. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you next week.